I'm going to talk today then about uh, legumes in intercropping. And uh, to kick straight off then, um, when we consider legume-based cropping systems, I like to think of them as then what we call simultaneous systems, so systems where the species are mixed. And then, of course, intercroppings there, but also with agroforestry, we move into things like alley cropping, savannah parklands. And then we have what we call sequential systems, spatially zoned, which are more rotations, so grain legume cereal rotations and green manures, etc. But the important thing then is that in the simultaneous systems, we have these direct interactions of competition, facilitation or allelopathy. And in the sequential systems, of course, the competition's not there. So we're just simply looking at residual effects or allelopathy. Now, when I come through, you'll see that many systems actually don't fall into one or the other. They're a bit of both. And I want to consider particularly in the talk, then thinking about the benefits of um, intercropping for companion crops or for subsequent crops. So, first of all, a bit about nitrogen fixation. This is a, a picture I took quite some time ago of nitrogen fixation in the field, a clear demonstration of the benefits, the prolific dark green nitrogen fixing varieties of groundnut. And in the foreground and, and in the middle of the picture, you see yellow varieties. These are basically varieties which are not able to form nodules. So they're non-nodulating varieties of the legumes. And these are, I always like to say, they're not much use to the farmer, but they're fantastic research tools because they're basically the same plant, but without the nodules. And so we can use these for measuring nitrogen fixation. That's quite difficult to do in the field. Of course, it's easy to do in pots and a lot of research on nitrogen and particularly nitrogen exudation or loss from nitrogen from, from the roots of legumes has been done in, in pots like this, where we've got inoculated and uninoculated plants of groundnut. And just to remind you all, of course, nitrogen fixation plays place in these bumps on the roots, these root nodules, which house the bacteria. Here's a transverse section of a root nodule. So there's the root and we cut through the nodule. You see there's the uh, vascular tissue of the plant, which envelops the uh, infected zone in the middle here. And this zone is absolutely full of bacteria. But these bacteria are modified, so they've lost their, their shape. They're here in groundnut. They're seen as circles in an electron microscope in transverse section. Here's the, the boundary. There's the boundary of the, the cell, the vacuole, the nucleus, and these are what we call them bacteroids. And if we look at them in a scanning electron micrograph here, you can see in, in groundnut, they, they're modified into little like little golf balls. They're isolated then in a peribacteroid membrane, which separates them from the host cytoplasm, but they've actually there inside the cell. This is really, for me, always when I think about it, probably the most fantastic result of evolution that there's ever been. And it's in these bacteria then that the process of nitrogen fixation takes place. Now, if we think about amounts of nitrogen fixed by legumes, um, this is based partly on from my, my book, which was actually then the last edition was uh, is 20 years ago. And I, I keep thinking about writing another edition, but it's so much work. But I'm working with a group of people, Mark Peoples and others, on a, a review of global nitrogen fixation. And I think these are just about the most up to date types of figures. Nearly all of the legumes and apologies for not having Vicia Farba in this slide. Uh, fix something in the order of 60 to 80 percent of their nitrogen. Common bean is a bit of an exception because it tends to fix uh, a lower proportion of its nitrogen and the amounts contributed in agriculture can be really very substantial but depend very much on how well the crop grows. Now if we think then about what determines the amount of nitrogen fixed, we think very much about the percentage of nitrogen fixed. That's the reliance of the legume on nitrogen fixation for growth. But the total amount of nitrogen fixed, of course, depends on the biomass produced. Yeah. And of course, we calculate the amount of legume nitrogen just from the dry matter times the percent nitrogen there. But I'll be talking about this uh, percent nitrogen fixed and the reliance on nitrogen fixation later in the talk. Now, 
we've just been doing in this review of global nitrogen fixation, looking at how much nitrogen in legume is below ground. And we think that that comes up to about 30% of legume nitrogen in most grain legumes. So here, this is a, an average across different species, except pigeon pea, chickpea and grass pea, where you seem to have more about 50% about below ground. And that's in then the coarse roots, the fine roots and in rhizo deposition. So these are all measurements that have been made using 15N labeling, where 15N was applied to the shoots of the plants and then looking actually at the loss of that 15N labelled nitrogen into the soil and measurements and recovery. And I'll come back to that later on. Now, very often when we're measuring nitrogen inputs from legumes, we think about this nitrogen balance method. So we're looking at the total nitrogen accumulated. And of course, in the legume, that's the soil nitrogen and the fixed nitrogen together is the total nitrogen. We put alongside another plant, a, a non-legume, which can only use the soil nitrogen. And then basically we calculate the amount of nitrogen from nitrogen fixation based on the soil nitrogen in a different plant. Now we can often do this with a non-nodulating variety, but it's sometimes done with cereal crops. And of course the danger there is that we're making this assumption that the legume and the non-legume are taking up the same amount of nitrogen. I'll come on to intercropping very soon. And if you want to know more about measuring plant associated nitrogen fixation, so symbiotic nitrogen fixation, there's this manual which I helped to co author. It's, uh, I think it's still really the state of the art in terms of methods, and it can be downloaded from this link uh, free of charge. So it's there available as an open source publication. So we often use then. 15N in these studies and, and there are three isotopes of nitrogen. The most common one, of course, is 14N. It's a, the stable isotope, but 15N is a stable isotope, which means that we can use it in the field without any problems. The only radioactive isotope of nitrogen has a very short half-life and can only really be used in biochemical studies. So in nature, the air has this constant of 0.3663 atom percent 15N. 99.6% of the atmosphere is um, 14N. And then we can basically measure the excess above that background as the uh, enrichment of a plant. Now, I'll, I'll not go into this in great detail here. There's much more in my book if you want to know about it, but we really need to use these methods when we're trying to estimate and, and understand the nitrogen balance of intercrops. And there's a lot of work that has been done using uh, isotopic dilution, and I can't really spend time on that today, but I think there's a lot of fundamentally flawed research published. That's what I basically like to say, and we can discuss that, that later. So some examples then of legume uh, cereal intercropping. Here's one of uh, cowpea intercrop with sorghum in northern, northern Nigeria. This is Peter Crawford. I, I tell you, this man is not a dwarf. Uh, he's quite a, a tall person, but these sorghum uh, varieties can reach up to three meters. And maybe just let's take a couple of minutes just to, if you could think about what are the interactions that the legume is experiencing, experiencing in this intercrop, yeah? Now, I can't actually see the chat, but I don't know if people would like, uh, I don't know how that works in in Teams, Joachim. I can see Joachim and that's all. Yeah, so I, I see the chat as well. So if, if people have an idea if about that. If people would like to put can... things in the chat, can yeah. we just think about what are the interactions that, we're, that we'll be experiencing between the legume and the cereal? Shading is said. Uh... Okay, so that's an example of of what of we've got competition competition facilitation or or uh, allelopathy competition for light i would say so competition for light Others? Then, uh, someone says the legumes might climb the sorghum indeed so we have different climbing varieties so that would be a form potentially of facilitation where the plant can 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 climb any more 
Uh, Remy says a nice differentiation for N for for nitrogen. Nice one. So is that is that an example then of niche differentiation? So I'd call that weak competition, I guess. More. And uh, that's it for now. That's all the imagination we have as a group. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll 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 see some more as we go on. So here we have uh, sorghum and groundnut, uh, very similar in northern Nigeria. On the right, then a bit more of a chaotic situation with pearl millet and cowpea. And there you can see the cowpea climbing up the, the millet. A rather pretty one from southern India, which I like very much, which is groundnut with, with scattered sunflower, two oilseed crops together. Uh, another one here where we're not looking at row intercropping. So just to flick back, this is what we'd call row intercropping on the left. Here we've got what we'd call mixed intercropping. Here we've got strip intercropping. And of course, strip cropping, I think, has become incredibly popular here in, in the Netherlands and in Europe recently. But here with pearl millet on one side, sorghum on the other, cowpea in the middle. And here in southern, in, in uh, South America, very typical uh, intercropping of maize and common bean, where you can see that the common bean has the support of the maize. So you could call this a facilitation. And this is extremely common in the Andean highlands. And sometimes then here's a, a triple intercrop also from the Andean highlands with maize and common bean with then faba bean also grown in between. So. These types of intercrops are really ubiquitous in, in the tropics. This is a slightly different version. And when I was saying about sequential or simultaneous systems, this is a relay crop of maize and common bean, where you can see the maize has already been harvested, but the bean was sown as an understory crop under the maize and then allowed to develop later. So we have these two interactions, competition and facilitation. So competition where the crops are attempting to use the same resource pool, they have overlapping niches, facilitation where one species is making the environment more favorable for growth of the other. And I like to think of that in relation to this sort of simple niche diagram then. So we have competitive exclusion if there's very strong overlap of niches or coexistence where there's weak competition. And of course, in intercropping, we're looking for situations to maximize complementarity so that we have this uh, very weak competition. So going back to our situation of the cowpea and uh, sorghum, I think there's another form of facilitation here, which is, of course, sorry, this is, uh, this is groundnut and sorghum, which is microclimate modification. Of course, the legume here is experiencing much more relative humidity and extremely dry climate than it would do in a sole crop where the wind would, a dry wind would be blowing across the crop. So there's another form of facilitation here as well, I think. But when we think about intercropping for soil fertility and how we get the best yield from intercrops with legumes, of course, the choice of species is important. But with our legumes, we have a whole variety of uh, durations and types. In cowpea, you have bush varieties or climbing varieties, the same in common bean. So you have to choose the right genotype for the right arrangement you have. And it's really a, a brilliant topic for research because, of course, you can fiddle around with planting dates and densities to manage competition and to increase complementarity. But the point I'd make here that in general, if nutrients are limiting, then intercropping really doesn't give an advantage. Often we find more nutrients are extracted by intercrops than soil crops because they have this complementarity of root volumes. And I heard something about that in the from the previous discussion where you have mutual avoidance of roots and then greater contact of roots and soil. And in our situation, here with uh, groundnuts and sorghum. Obviously, the sorghum can root down to one and a half to two meters. The, the groundnut is largely rooting in the top 50 centimeters of soil. So there's clearly a complementarity in terms of root distributions there very much. Now, getting on to the, 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 the nub, if you like, the crux of my talk. If we think what happens to nitrogen fixation 
by legumes in intercrops. Well, generally, compared with a sole crop, the amount of nodulation in the nitrogen fix tends to be less than in the sole crop. Because essentially, you've got less biomass in total of the legume, and the legume is often then subject to some competition. At the same time, the proportion of the, of the nitrogen that the legume gets from nitrogen fixation tends to be greater in the intercrop because the associated crop and particularly cereals compete very well for the soil nitrogen so that the legume becomes more dependent on nitrogen fixation for its own growth. And this gives then an overall yield of nitrogen in the intercrop, which is larger than the sole crops. But then the big question is this, is this then due to a sparing of soil nitrogen, which would be weak competition, or is it due to the direct contribution of nitrogen to the associated crop, which would be a facilitation? And this direct contribution is what people often refer to as nitrogen transfer. Now, this remains to be actually a highly debated and controversial topic, I feel. But I'd like to share with you uh, some research I'm rather proud of, and I, I want to, to run the competition here. Is this the oldest paper of anybody has referred to? This is one I published in 1991, and we were working on uh, a lot using nitrogen uh, isotope methods to look at these features of intercropping back in the 19, um, in the end of the 1980s, in fact. So I've been working on this for, you know, getting on for 40 years, actually. So in this experiment, you'll see here a nodulated variety of bean grown with maize and a non-nodulated variety grown with maize. And we had also treatments in this paper with and without mycorrhizal infection. So I can't go into the full details. You're welcome to read the paper, but the question is nitrogen transferred directly from the beans to the intercrop maize? Well, the answer is yes. If we apply 15N to these leaves, we can trace that back into the maize plant. But even under these conditions of total nitrogen starvation, less than 5% of the nitrogen in the beans was actually recovered in the maize. So I'd argue, are there significant amounts transferred? I think probably not. We had no clear difference with my, our buscular mycorrhiza present, and that doesn't surprise me because nitrogen itself is a very mobile nutrient and mycorrhizas only really assist in uptake of immobile nutrients. And the other point is that the maize nitrogen accumulation was less when intercropped with nitrogen fixing beans than with the non-nodulating variety because of the competition here. Uh, between the two plants. Now, when we think then about how does nitrogen become available for other plants from legumes, well, we can think about mechanisms below or above ground. Obviously, we've got root and nodule senescence and mineralization, which is a relatively slow process, but is probably the major route by which nitrogen becomes available. Rhizo deposition is very rapid or transfer between plants through mycorrhizas would be rapid, but the importance in terms of a nitrogen source is really very minimal. From above ground, then mineralization of severed or senesced plant material, so particularly here fallen leaves, so leaves that fall from the legumes can be a major source for uh, companion crops or later crops. Consumption, so grazing, particularly by grazing animals, can actually turn this into a rapid process. So think about grass clover mixtures being grazed by cattle and then that nitrogen being excreted onto the grass. That can really be a major source of transfer. We have potential leachates from leaves, so, so washing out of nitrogen from leaves, which does happen but again is minimal. We have actually gaseous transfer through ammonia, which has also been demonstrated that legumes can lose nitrogen as ammonia to the atmosphere, and this can be taken up by the crops. But I think that is minimal as well. So nitrogen fixing plants generally don't sit there pushing out nitrogen into the environment for other plants. They fix nitrogen for themselves and they lose it when they die in senesce. That would be my point. Now, 
what about intercropping? Here's another paper from the <clears throat> 1980s when some really good research was being done. What we see here is that the land equivalent ratio is highest. Sorry, uh, I've lost. Yeah, I cut off the uh, the bottom axis in that. Sorry. So if we look at this slide, first of all, <clears throat> you'll see here it's a um, yield of groundnut or maize as an intercrop. So there's the, the ground, the, there's the, uh, the maize, here's the, the groundnut with different rates of nitrogen applied. So no difference in growth with intercrops or um, sole maize, but a real increase in biomass in the maize with an increase in nitrogen, which is what you'd expect. But the legume actually decreasing in biomass as the maize gets uh, stronger so you get more competitive interactions here in terms of shading when the the cereal is highly fertilized with with nitrogen so here you see the ler is fairly constant across these rates in this slide which is uh, i've cut off the bottom axis in in transposing this picture from the paper you'll see that um the legume does much better when the maize is not fertilized and here we're up to rates of four tons of maize so strong maize growth, strong competition with the legume, and a really decline in the land equivalent ratio with more nitrogen added, because of course the nitrogen is replacing the benefit of nitrogen fixation in the intercrop. That's less in this year in 1980 when basically the maize grew more poorly and therefore wasn't so competitive with the legume. Now we've had quite a number of other PhDs working on intercropping. This is a horribly complex slide. Sorry for that. I cut it out of the paper, but we're looking here at the performance of different intercrop arrangements. So mixed one to one rows, two to two rows or sole maize or sole cowpea. And this paper actually has a whole uh, range of different legumes intercrop with maize in these different um, arrangements, but also looking across different fields, so high fertility, medium fertility or low fertility fields in two environments, one with more rainfall, one with less rainfall. So the results are clearest here in the where rainfall is very limiting, where you see that productivity declines across these high to medium to low fertility fields. But when we look at the land equivalent ratios, <clears throat> you'll see that the clearest results are here where the land equivalent ratios are really going up under lower fertility conditions. So the point I'd really want to drive home here is that the benefits of intercropping are generally better when soil fertility is poor and therefore the competitive interaction and the comp competition of the cereal is suppressed. Yeah? So if you give the cereal a lot of nitrogen, it's very competitive and that tends to outcompete the legume, particularly where you've got them more mixed, either one to one rows or two to rows, where there isn't so much space between them. Now, I, last example I'd like to give you is one on pigeon pea maize, which I call relay intercropping, although it's not strictly relay intercropping because they're planted together, mixed in rows. And here's the pigeon pea growing under the maize. But when the maize is ready <clears throat> for harvest, the pigeon pea is just growing through and the pigeon pea continues as a sole crop into the dry season here in southern Malawi. So it's, it's a, a, a simultaneously planted intercrop which then develops into a sole pigeon pea crop. And to me, this is the best example of an intercrop in the world. <laughs> now, the pigeon pea then drops a lot of leaf here up to 90 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare added into the soil in fallen leaves at the end of the season and actually this gives such good cover that often the fields are completely weed free in the next season. Now we've done a lot of studies looking at release of nitrogen, I need to skip over that for now but we could come back to that. So here in uh, this example then from Mozambique, a PhD of uh, Leonard Rizinamodzi, this is after three years of intercropping or sole maize. Our sole maize producing around half a ton of maize, a distinct row intercrop where we substitute one row of maize with one row of pigeon pea, giving only uh, two tons plus the, 
the pigeon pea yield and you'll see pigeon pea doesn't yield a huge amount of grain directly. A within row intercrop where the pigeon pea is simply planted into maize and the maize density is maintained the same. We've got five tons of production with no fertilizer added in this case. And maize after three years of sole pigeon pea, we get the same yield. So this shows that there's fantastic com complementarity here. But the big question is, why is the sole maize yielding so poorly? And this is after three years, we're down to only half a ton of maize in the sole maize crop. Well, I'll give it away directly. This pretty little flower is a thing called Striga. It's Striga asiatica. And in the sole maize crop here, Striga is built up to the extent that it's virtually killing the maize. But in the intercrop, Striga is completely absent. So the legume here is completely suppressing the Striga growth and the nitrogen, which is being contributed by the legume over these three years is now giving us five tons of maize production with no nitrogen added. So it's a really a fantastic example. Ah, I just put in this slide during the previous talk. I got this one yesterday from Esther Mugi who's just writing a PhD with, uh, she's supervised by Lamert uh, Nielsen, myself. And <clears throat> she's been studying then the, the phenology of these crops. And here you see this is maize uh, growing over a period of up to four months before harvest. Here's the pigeon pea planted at the same time and actually continuing then growing into the uh, dry season. You see it's not accumulating extra biomass here, but during this period it's dropping a lot of fallen leaves. So that example is just a, a documentation of this uh, difference in phenology. Uh, here we've got then basically this is the sole maize and the intercrop maize, the different intercrops with uh, actually this is with lab lab or different long or medium duration pigeon pea. But you'll see that basically there's very little competition in terms of suppression of maize growth but then we have this addition of the pigeon pea growth as well. So to finish off with some conclusions, or I could give them you, I think, as hypotheses for the future. Well, farmers intercrop legumes and cereals, of course, for many reasons, particularly for the difference in products, the food, the nitrogen rich, the protein rich grain of the legume, but also then for the biomass, for weed suppression, for soil fertility. I think the over yielding that we see in legume cereal intercrops is really due to weak competition and not due to direct transfer, so facilitation. Intercropping tends to be more beneficial when competition for light is weaker, so when soil fertility is poor or where you don't put ridiculous amounts of nitrogen on your cereals. The temporal complementarity is very important in intercrops where we have long duration legumes such as pigeon pea, but we see that also with other long duration legumes like uh, cow pea, creeping cow pea or uh, lab lab. And the residual benefits that legumes have in these systems are much larger than we can explain solely due to their nitrogen benefits. So the rotational benefits are often due to the suppression of pests and diseases compared with continuous monocropping or suppression of striga and the like, in addition to the inputs of nitrogen. So that's what I uh, had for you today. Um, maybe I'll stop sharing my screen.